Okay. So we are now recording. And um, so the, I am being joined by Natalie Bruno, who is um, an incredible coach um, and a really good friend of mine. And um, so this, this new podcast episode branch of the rantings um, is the brainchild of the two of us talking about um, the events that are happening in the country, in the world, and how we experience them sometimes very similarly and sometimes very differently um, as two women at different stages of life with different ethnic makeups um, and with similar training, which I think gives us a foundational point with which that we discuss these things. Um, would you agree, Nat? I do. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so we're going to kind of kick this thing off and see how this goes. Um, no real format other than to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to do these um, firebrand conversations um, by really tackling some of the, you know, issues that have happened um, over, you know, the last week or two in between each episode. These will be bi-weekly. Um, meaning every other week and, uh, and then just kind of hashing them out and, uh, and then we'll just kind of see how this thing evolves. Okay. Um, so I think for me, when I think back to the last week, <laughs> um, obviously the results of the election are, are a huge thing, um, which I experienced them from a very interesting perspective. Um, and then inside of that election piece amongst everything else that goes along with it um, are the attacks on Kamala Harris. Those things um, were really prominent for me. Um, I know that you are not as um, involved or engaged in terms of news and politics uh, and, and things like that. However, you did vote and <laughs> you know about the election. So kind of what, what's your take um, and, and how did that show up for you like in regular life? Um, in regular life, I was actually talking to my husband about uh, Kamala yesterday, last night, just from the excitement of, you know, in my mind, she's breaking a huge glass ceiling. I'm really excited. I feel like this opens the door for so many other young women rising up through the ranks. Um, and it's exciting. Like, I think it's really exciting that this is happening. I, you know, we're seeing history and it's, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I mean, and I definitely feel the same way. And I think for me, there's the woman piece of it first mm -hmm. um, because like, that's just like the, the thing that we could all identify with. Um, especially coming like right after the anniversary of like women's suffrage and the right to vote and all of that. Right. Um, but then also her being a woman of color yeah. and the conversations that I've, that I've heard around her and her race, her ethnicity, her, um, the culture that's been interesting. Um, and I've experienced it from both sides, hearing, hearing blacks talk about it and hearing white people talk about it has been interesting. Um, so for example, um, you'll have some of the really woke black folk who will say, uh, you know, well, she's not really, she's not really a person of color. She's not really black. She's not really African-American um, because, you know, she's Indian, she's this, she's that. Plus she doesn't really represent black folk because as the, you know, um, attorney state attorney for california you know she she prosecuted and locked up a bunch of black people so you have that one piece yeah. um and then i had white people saying well she's part indian and jamaican so tell me how that makes her african-american um because they don't understand that every, like the majority of jamaicans are from west africa <laughs> like that that's where everyone originated from so did you hear anything around those conversations? Um, and yeah, no, I personally did not. I, I know that she is a woman of color. Um, I, I heard this is just through co like normal conversation of, oh, this is what's happening, especially when she first 
was um, selected to run with Biden, I heard a lot of, oh, well, her, her, one of her family, like her mother, I don't remember, her mother, father was Jamaican and her other um, parent was white and Indian. And in my mind, I get a little annoyed with things like that personally, because I think if you were to do anyone's DNA, Mm -hmm. we are... I say this a lot of love for all, you know, all people, but we are mutts. Like we come from so many different backgrounds. Right. And it's hard in my mind to say, I'm sure there are people that, you know, are 90% X, Y, Z. However, I know just for me alone, oh my goodness, I have Greek, Hungarian, um, German, uh, Spanish, Puerto Rican. I mean, just so much in my background. So I feel, I don't know. I just feel like it's hard to peg someone. And then, and then my other thought is like, okay. And <laughs> how is that? And how is that even relevant outside of good, good. There's a person, another per- again, in my mind, that's honestly another glass ceiling that she's breaking and not only is she a woman but she is a woman of color so i i saw a black girl on uh on my facebook the other day that she said well tell me what's up with them saying woman of color like what color is she as if that was derogatory and i responded and i said well i think in her case uh i think in her case using the woman of color is to be respectful of all of her all of her ethnicities and all of her cultural backgrounds because they are very diverse um, and they don't just fall under under one umbrella. And you know, so I, you, it's funny how different people are offended by different uses of terminology when it comes to race. I think now this is just my opinion, right? Yeah. Um, the backlash that I have seen her undergo. Now, keep in mind, this is an attorney. This is a this is a Howard University graduate. Um, you know, law school graduate uh, in California, former state attorney for for the state of California, um, senator for however long now. And if you saw a formal a former Google director's wife made a comment about, you know, well, the only qualification she needed was a black vagina. She didn't say vagina. I'm saying vagina. Um, but you know, this. Um, Joe and the hoe, she slept her way to the top. Like there's been this, there's been this attack on her that I find to be interesting um, because she's more than qualified for the position. She's certainly more qualified than the current commander in chief, (laughs) right? Um, It speaks to our society of what we think of successful women Mm -hmm. um i think it go it runs much deeper than kamala i think you could look potentially to the position you're in at work or any woman leadership and they've run into rumors or comments or um feeling like they've been objectified in some way because Mm -hmm. of their women because of just their female so Uh, I, I think the thing that is interesting, though, is is the only time that you really saw um, personal attacks were, for example, with Elizabeth Warren, with the whole Pocahontas comment, right, which is racial in. So I heard blips of the Pocahontas comment. Can you fill me in on? Yeah, I mean, like- basically, Donald Trump mocked her when she said that part of her, she was part Native American. Um he, he referenced her, and so now a lot of the Republican and GOP party, they, they refer to her as Pocahontas. And I think that the, the thing that bothers me about that, besides the fact that it, it's, a, it's racial, right? Like you are- it's not her name. Um, yeah, it's not her name, but, yeah. but, but to say Native American and the first thing that you go to is Pocahontas, Pocahontas was not a Disney character. Pocahontas was literally a victim of human trafficking, sex trafficking. There's nothing funny about that to be mocked. Um, It's offensive, right? And to see, it appears (laughs) for me as a woman of color that if there is something racial to be 
pointed out or, or um, honed in on, you see that more than anything else, you know, uh, with the other female. So for example, what, what was her name? Jill, um, who ran for president? Uh, libertarian. Oh Jill, Jor Jill, 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 Jorgensen, Jill Jorgensen. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so who, you didn't hear anything. There, were nobody, nobody was attacking her. Nobody was talking about her. Nobody was whatever. You didn't hear it from uh, Tulsi Gabbard. You just, you just didn't hear it. Uh, and so, let me ask you your opinion. Do you think that there is a segment of the population? Uh, particularly who are Trump supporters or Republicans who um, are, are, are mad or jealous or whatever of the fact that it's uh, Kamala Harris that has, that has become the first woman VP and she happens to be a woman of color um, and, that is, and that it's a racially motivated, whether consciously or subconsciously, reaction to her that uh, that is that is intensifying the attacks against her and her character i think it would be naive to say that there's not i mean i'm not sure how big the quote segment of people would be um i agree that there's a lot of unconscious bias as well uh toward women of color toward women in general um mm -hmm. I think women of color deal with a whole different level of challenges from our society. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, in my mind, my first thought, and you know me, Danny, is I'd have to go and research it to really speak <laughs> to it confidently. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's naive to think that there aren't people out there that choose not to like her just because she's a woman and she's a woman of color and she's a Democrat. Right. I mean, you know, if, if there's a value difference between the two and I think, um, I think that makes up a, a huge gap is the values first. And then you go from there, you know, it's unfortunate in my mind why there hasn't been a woman VP or president yet anyway. I mean, we're in 2020. So I don't know. I, I, you know, when we say that we're in 2020, I don't know how much things have changed. I mean, it's like for every step forward, I still see three steps that have either stayed stagnant or have gone in the opposite direction. Right. And so like, and maybe I am, maybe I am, I wonder if I see things, you know, this is the interesting thing is like, I go, okay, so am I seeing this for what it is? Did I hear this the way that it is? Should I be offended by this or am I being overly sensitive? Because the other thing that it would be naive to say is that it would be naive for me to say that the last six months, with, um, you know, the George Floyd murder, with the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, with, you know, all of those things, um, with the black men being found hung from trees and suddenly they're just all suicides. It would be naive of me to, to say, oh, that's not impacting me. I'm not, I'm not vigilant or, um, or, or, uh, you know, expecting to, to see things like that, especially given the area where I'm in, where it is on average 95% white. Yeah. And then I think when you, when you couple that with like somebody popping in my inbox last week and calling me, you know, a half bred dog and half white trash, um, I, I definitely see a racial component from the individuals around here and the people who, who have interacted on my page. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you were, it, it makes me curious if we were to go out and inter interview, um, depending on location and, and their upbringing, um, you know, of course we all have choice, but oftentimes when we're kids, we don't, we don't have a lot of choice of what we're exposed to and, and what our parents believe and what they push from a core value system right. um, into our life. And so um, I I don't know. I, it's hard. I know people say, you know, the South is Trump country or, or whatever. And, um, 
because in my mind, it really boils also down to your religious beliefs as well. You know, of, you know, if someone believes differently, then they're bad in some form, fashion, or way, or they're... But see, then, but I, on that note, when we start to talk about religion and we bring spirituality into it, I call bullshit. And the reason I do, the reason I do is you take someone like the first lady, right? Whose previous job was to pose nude. Like she was a porn star, full frontal. There you go. Even, even with a lesbian theme cuddled up with another woman. So if you have these Christian Trump supporters who don't like the fact that Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris had, uh, you know, a relationship with an older man. I think, I think he was 50 something, um, closing up, closing in on 60 and she was 29. Um, he'd been separated for a decade from his wife. And so, I mean, they were openly dating so forth and so on. And the, that relationship ended in 1995. She was not elected to any office until 2003. So for people to say that somehow that one relationship, how does that one singular monogamous relationship equate to Joe and the Ho and she slept her way to the top when there are magazines and websites with Melania's vagina everywhere and she's untouchable. If it's not a race difference, what's the difference? What? Well, I think number one, my first thought is, um, and I don't agree with any of it. So just looking at it from like a clinical standpoint, stepping back just from an observation, my first thought is Melania is not running for office. You but know? she's putting, she's putting policy. She, she is. I, her no I agree campaign. She, has, she has a lot of influence and she is, um, you know, pushing for different, uh, leg- but at the same time, she does not represent the presidency the same way that the president does. Okay, well, neither did Vanessa Williams when she won the Miss America, America contest. And because she had posed for Playboy, they stripped her of her crown. Like there, there continues to be this double standard. Um, when I look at how, like you can even see it, like I, I can send you links because you and I, we research things. Mm-hmm. And so I can show you articles where they talk about the adultification of of, of black girls, of brown girls, where at early ages, they are suspended at higher rates than, than their white counterparts. They are um, expelled higher at higher rates. They, are, they, are, they have the police call them at higher rates. They are considered fast ass little girls uh, by the time that they're nine and 10 when their white counterparts don't get the same thing. So I, I, think, that, I think that we have to pay attention to what we see happening to our black and brown girls from the time that they're little girls when they're still innocent um all the way into their adulthood and 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 say why would we expect for that double standard to go away if it's present then well i think time i mean that's the only thing that's really going to assist it is is opening people's awareness and really having people step back and question you know why they believe what they believe or why they feel um, any type of threat or negativity toward a certain individual or group of people, um, and really kind of investigate their own feelings, which I feel like Black Lives Matter has really pushed. I think mm-hmm. a lot of Americans, uh, white, Hispanic, like all, all across the board have, for the most part, at least at some point, stepped back and had some hard conversations with themselves and hopefully some really hard conversations with others. Um, And I guess to me, having two little brown girls, or three now, sorry, (laughs) three little brown girls, um, it is a concern because it's not something that I've ever had to encounter. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I grew up in a very country area where there was blatant racism in my high school. you know, where it wasn't appropriate to date across the line per se. And, and it, in my mind, I, I disliked it then. I dislike it now. I don't agree with it. However, it's there. Right. You know, it's something that I don't think we can ignore. 
Right. You know, it's, it makes me question, as you can hear them in the background, it makes me question how do I prepare my daughters um, as they go into and move into their lives and how, what, what do I need to tell them of how to handle certain situations? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a balance in my mind. I don't, I don't want them to have to look for it because I feel like that can also be an extreme where we go into a filter of always being suspicious and being on guard. And I don't want them to live that, that way. I want them to walk in their wisdom and not in their fears. Right. However, I want them also to be able to stand up against um, any inappropriate behavior. So I think that that's the difference between looking for something and being aware um, and being informed and prepared for the realities that come with life until those realities become something different. Right. Um, I think that some of the things that we see today can be traced, whether people like it or not, all the way back to slavery. Yeah. And I agree with that. So. Okay, so the colorism that you heard me talk about when we talk about black people and the way that they would talk about Kamala Harris or even the way that they would talk about me being biracial, right? That is um, that is definitely something that you saw um, intentionally instigated and, and ingrained um, during slavery. And, you know, you said, you said, I don't know why any woman would attack her because she's the first woman. But if you go back and... It, look at Kamala Harris, she's not dark skin, right? She's, she's darker than me, but she's not dark skin. And if you think about um, the, the black women, the slaves that the master slept with, they look like her, <clears throat> they look like me. Yeah. And, and oftentimes the white, the white mistresses of the house would be super jealous of the preferential treatment that those lighter skin women got from, and even the darker skin ones, whoever the master was sleeping with. And oftentimes you would see those white women um, beat and, uh, and maim those slaves even worse than the, than the male masters. So to me, when I see those attacks happening now, even if it's just verbally, and even if it's just on social media or in the media, immediately that's a part that comes up for me um, as a biracial woman, that is something that rises up in me that goes, this shit's still here. Yeah, I think it is to a certain extent. And I, I think, um, you know, this is in my mind, a big reason why we're creating firebrands is because for some reason, uh, it's, it's almost commonplace for women to put other women down um, yeah. for a, a wide, and again, I go back to our, you know, emotional capacity. And it, to me, it just speaks to the person's self-worth that they just don't really have enough self-worth to be open to allowing someone else to exist simultaneously why they do. And so when we talk about that, so like um, when I was in college, I took this great course and, uh, and we took a look at the way that uh, like if you next time you go into the grocery store walk to the magazine section and look at the difference between men's magazine covers and women's magazine covers women's magazine covers are always um put pitting each other against each other so think about it when you open the magazines after like the emmys or the oscars the the who wore it best right, right. and they'll compare the women wearing the same dress right we, we are, um, you know, this idea that, you know, because there's more women than men, then, you know, we, there's always the cat fight, the cattiness, the, uh, the attacks. And I think that's, that's there. And then you add the racial component on top of it and it just becomes this space. And until people, until people are a willing to confront themselves and their own innate inherent biases and prejudices that we all have. Um, these things will continue to show up subconsciously and even um, and even consciously to some degree um, because that's part of doing the work. And 
I think, but nobody wants to say, nobody wants to admit I would be the person that would attack you simply because of ABCD, XYZ. Oh yeah. That's why it's so easy to do online because yeah. oftentimes it, you can just hide behind your profile, whoever you may be. Well, you saw the woman. So the, the, the Google, the former Google director's wife that we, that, you know, talked about all she had to have as a qualification was her black vagina. Well, she blamed it on her medication. She, she said she'd had her medication changed and that's what made her say that. Um, now here's what's crazy. Her husband came back after he resigned from the position and his statement that he gave was that his wife is in no way racist, get this. And here's the reason why she can't be racist because she has done a lot of volunteer work at, in at-risk communities and impoverished neighborhoods or whatever word he used. Now here's the thing, that in and of itself indicates a negative stereotype as if the only people in impoverished and at-risk communities are black people, right? Are people of color. Like that in and of itself says, you are in fact a bigot. Like if you're not a full-blown racist, you're a bigot because you hold a negative stereotype against a particular group of people. And you said it in the justification of your racism. I think it's unfortunate, but I, I think that is a very accurate perspective though of a lot of people that when you think of impoverished communities um, in big cities, you think of projects and you think of people of color. Right, um, but why is that? It's, I mean, that goes all the way back to redlining. That goes yeah. back to like, it was by design. It was, I, and I completely agree in my mind. Um, if I had, you know, if I had a magic wand, I'd have everyone focus on our academic and, you know, communities and neighborhoods because to me, I don't think it's right that people who are just born into whatever ethnicity or, but the big thing to it is money. Again, you know me, Danny, I just take it back to money because if you have enough of it, then it can get you out of a lot of things. You know, sure. if you're arrested, you know, if you have money, you can get a lawyer, you can get out. If you're not, you're you stuck. And then you just get caught into um, this, this, the circle. You froze on me. You'll be back. <laughs> Waiting for his um, trip for three years because he couldn't afford bail. Right. You, you, you are, you were frozen. frozen. Can you hear me? Ah, you're back. There you are. Okay. So, so there you're you talking, okay. yeah, we were both frozen. So you're talking about Khalif Browder, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. okay. So, so going the Khalif Browder story for me, did you watch it? Did you watch the series on Netflix, the documentary? I did not. No, I did not. Okay. I did. I braved it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I will tell you that, um, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever watched. Yeah, it really was. And what I wasn't prepared for at the end of the whole story, because I knew, I knew that he hung himself. I knew that he committed suicide. I knew that already, but what I wasn't prepared for was at the end of the final episode, it's only like five episodes long at the end of the final episode, as they're recounting this cycle that happens, there's this footage that rolls of all of these black men who are being shot and killed by police. And one of them, I just can't get his image. You know me, certain images stick in my brain. And there's this one guy that when the cop shoots him, you literally see immediately his entire body go limp and just slump like thud to the ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that what, what bothers me about things um, that I, that, that have to be addressed is one in every 1000 black men will be killed by the police. One in 1000. That's astronomical. That's crazy. Right. Um, it's two and, and a half times. Your, where'd you get that? One in 1000. I haven't heard. Yeah. That. It's a study. Hold on. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah. I'm curious. Maybe pop that in the notes. I'd like to look in. That's crazy. Um, no, that's okay. right. So here it is. Um, okay. 
So it's the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. And here's what it says. Um, so um, risk is highest for black men who at current levels of risk face about a one in 1000 chance of being killed by police over the life course. The average lifetime odds of being killed by police are about one in 2000 for men and about one in 33,000 for women. Risk peaks between the ages of 20 and 35 for all groups, but for young men of color, police use of force is among the leading cause of death. So I, when people say to me, yeah, but more white people are killed by police than, um, than blacks, that's because whites make up 60% of the population. Right. Um, the actual number of homicides committed by blacks and whites are equal. And people will say, well, gosh, if blacks only make up 13% of the population and they're doing just as much killing as whites, then that means they're more violent. No, what it means is they're more impoverished, right? It means they're less, they're less educated in a lot of these communities. It means that they are in, oh gosh, there's this movie by Jamie Foxx, Jamie Foxx is in it. What's it called? It's called White House Down. He's in this movie and um, he wants to do, he wants to do this peace treaty and do away with this stuff. But anyway, this is what he says. He's, he's telling a story about, uh, he's the black president of the United States, by the way, in this movie. And he's telling this story about growing up in the projects and him learning that his, one of his good guy friends, um, their family is poor, doesn't have, a, doesn't have anything to eat. So the guy's planning to rob a store. He's committing, he's, he's planning to commit an armed robbery. So Jamie Foxx's character tells his grandmother, Big Mama, what's about to happen. And so she invites the friend over for dinner. And when the friend comes over and eats dinner, she says, you can stay here as long as you need, da 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 And he does and doesn't commit the armed robbery. And so Jamie Foxx says in the movie, the cure for violence is to eliminate poverty, right? Because people don't make such bad choices. They avoid drugs more, you know, they avoid, uh, you know, I go right there. Like money. In my mind, um, even taking away the color of someone's skin, it, it still boils down to money. Right. I mean, yes, there are biases for sure. Like, I have no doubt that there's. I kind of see it as like underlying currents that have come through the generations. I think it is much better than it has ever been personally. That's my personal opinion. Um, however, I think it's still there to think that it's not there. In my I think the election opinion. demonstrates that it's there. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of things demonstrate, I mean, just, uh, you know, my own upbringing demonstrates that it's there. You know, one of my high school boyfriends, his uncle was in the KKK, like it, you know, just Jesus. Well, the headquarters is right down the street from me. So, yeah, like, I mean, it, so I mean, yes, of course it's, it's there. I don't think it will ever go away. I don't. Um, I think it's not looked, it's not upheld in our society by any standard. I think if you talk to any average American, no matter what color, gender, or age they are, they would condemn, you know, white fascists. I think they condemn overt racism. Covert yeah. racism, people don't understand as much. They don't get it, and uh, and they become defensive, especially when it applies to them. So I think I think yeah, I think the civil rights movement made overt racism socially unacceptable, right? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I think Agreed. what it what it what it increased was covert racism, dog whistle politics. Um, and things like that, where you use words like, you know, um, states' rights, or you use words like um, suburban housewives, I'm protecting your neighborhoods. What do you mean? Let's go. Oh, what do you that's, mean? that's Trump. That's Trump. He literally tell, told suburban housewives that they should thank him because he's protecting their neighborhoods from keeping lower lower income people from moving into their neighborhoods. Well, you just said it, right? When you hear lower income, you automatically associate that with someone of color. So when he says at a political campaign rally, suburban housewives, as if women are only housewives, right? <laughs> That's the first thing, you misogynistic asshole. Um, but when he says suburban housewives, you should thank me. 
because I saved your neighborhoods from those low income, whatever, that is a dog whistle. Because so I, I, I'm going to jump in there because I work with um, a organization who serves uh, the impoverished and, and just from observing the majority is people of color. I mean, I just in this one instance. Okay. Right. But where are you at though? Talk about geographically. I'm in Charlotte. I'm in Charlotte uh, talking about Charlotte, North Carolina. Right. Um, and I will say that it it also goes both ways because you know when when people of color that are even lower class going into middle class areas, mm-hmm. they deal with emotional. Oh, well, we're not welcome here. Um, you know, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to live with these people but we're talking about classism versus racism and they are not the same thing i agree but i think to to separate them completely is not fair i you know Uh, so for me it is because here's the thing i can be a person of color and regardless of my class i am still going to experience racism like I am still going to, that is why, that is why you can watch, that is why you can watch footage of professional athletes. That's why you can watch footage of an, a black FBI agent getting harassed by white police officers because they don't know who they are. I agree that it happens. I think you could also uh, speak to quite a few people of color who haven't experienced racism. Have you? Yes. How yeah. many? I mean, I'm only one person, Danny. Yeah, I'm not but I'm curious, curious like that. But that. to think that there's not though, Danny, come on. Like there are some people who have grown up and they haven't experienced that. I, I would I would say haven't experienced yeah. cause I, it. My thing is the absolute, right? Like I feel like you're throwing a huge blanket onto millions of people and we really just don't know. Like that's my my thing is when you throw out an absolute, it's hard. Like you said earlier, a segment of you know Republican, sure, but how big is that and how socially it's not socially accepted at all. So to me, it's you don't think it's socially accepted. White fascist? No, I don't. No, I I didn't say that because overt overt racism, like white fascism. Um, isn't, but I'm, I mean, so what, so what do you call it when literally when, when the president of the United States sits on a debate stage and tells white nationalist groups stand back and stand by, what is that? I, I'm not familiar with that. I, I, I mean, I literally can't. in the, in the presidential debate between mm-hmm. Trump and Biden in mm-hmm. the very first one, president Trump was asked to denounce white supremacy. He was, he was, and he, he Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Look, I'm, I'm not debating. I don't know Trump. I'm not debating how he feels because I, quite frankly, I don't know. Um, but I, in my mind, looking at his past, is he an idiot when it comes to communication? Yes. Like, yes. Would I have loved for him to straight up condemn it? Like he has, I know, there has been speeches where he has completely condemned it uh, before. But to me, I just feel like going back out, like removing Trump from the conversation, to me, any type of absolute, there's going to be, um, you know, exceptions to the rule. Yeah, I'm not saying that that every single person of color has experienced, you know, overt racism in their lives. I'm not saying that. What I, what I am saying is that um, you don't get to the number of one in 1,000 black men being shot and killed by the police um, when it's not the overwhelming majority. And, you know, I think for people to act like it, that it doesn't impact the current environment is not true. When people wanna say that that's not the reason that they attack or that's not part of the reason that they attacked Kamala Harris, I call BS, right? Because for you're whatever reason the color of her skin is that what you're talking yeah, about yeah i mean because here's my thing like when 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 i look at um when i look at the standards to which women 
are are held because we're talking about women, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like as as black people, we are told you you have to work twice as hard, right? Um, to get even you know part of the opportunity. Um, it's just, I think I think for me, when I see that. 45% of the country or 40% of the country still voted for people who I, who I have heard um, say things to incite racial violence, to blatantly use dog whistle politics. Um, that is a, that is an astounding number. And that to me says yeah, no, I mean, like we've we've come a ways, but. Well, I think that the challenge I have um, in that arena is to me, it appears that you're assuming everyone looks at Trump the way you do, that he's a racist bigot. No, I'm, I don't assume, I don't assume that. What I assume is that not assume, what I have seen demonstrated very effectively on my page by his supporters are people who continuously justify anything he says, no matter how abhorrent, no matter how, um, you know, insightful, no, no matter anything. Yeah. And this, this willful ignorance and an intention, like cognitive dissonance. It is, that, that, it is that exists. kind of shocking. I mean, it's kind of shocking knowing his background. I mean, where people just come up. I actually had this conversation with my brother and uh, father over the weekend. And it is shocking how people can kind of sweep things under the carpet really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I, I think to me that, is value that to me is a value system that they're trying to uphold and he was the guy running it no different than and i'm pretty sure most not most um a segment because i don't know how many a segment of democrats really don't like biden that was not their first choice right they, i mean uh, he a lot of it was not first choice against Trump, right? Like, and so to me, Trump was not first choice at all. So it's, you know, it's kind of, it's hard in my mind to, to draw a line, but I, you, there's a value system difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. And but what that, do you think that value system difference is? It's, uh, I think, uh, big, big picture, right? Democrats are much more inclusive, I think, from a, a open standpoint in regards to um, the LGBTQ community. I think there is a, still a large LGBTQ community in Republican uh, stance as well. Um, so, so why do you equate LGBTQ stance as a value system? Because I think the Republican, and, and this is just my personal perception, right? In my mind, I see the Republican ticket, they run really heavy on Christian principles. Mm -hmm. And when you get down to like the more like very traditional biblical stance, you run into that brick wall of, um, oh, well, you know, men are supposed to be with women. Th mm -hmm. That's why I say abortion is another big one. Um, you know, these really big value differences. But follow me. But here's what I said so to me. This is why this is why I think that that um, people people have to stop being played. And like people are to me, to me, Christians who vote Republican on LGBTQ issues or on abortion issues are, are um, most likely, or the way that they appear to me, my perception of them yeah. is that they have, it's a false sense of morality Yeah. Um, that it's bullshit because here's the thing. If you are saying, I'm gonna vote Republican because of these two issues, but well, yet, just, you're, I was just using those. Two I know, but those are the main two. Those are the main two, but yeah. follow me. But if those two main issues um, are what cause you to vote Republican, and then the person that you vote for who is Republican, like pays off porn stars, has affairs, has multiple baby mamas, and says, grab women by the vagina. Right. 
this is a false sense of morality. Like seriously, right? You just want to feel good about yourself to be able to say, oh, I'm not for killing babies, which by the way, nobody's for killing babies, right? So I, so I think when we talk about values, um, to me, values- Coronavirus was another big one. I think the coronavirus and how it's been handled was another big um, challenge. You know, the, I, I know a lot of people feel some kind of way about wearing masks in public. Right. Ask the families of the quarter of a million people who are dead how they feel about masks. Right. So to me, I, I but that somehow got politicized. I'm not honestly quite sure how. Yeah. Um, but that is a big, I, I actually know uh, a friend of a friend who he refuses to leave his home because he refuses to wear masks. But at least keep his ass at home. <laughs> that, that was me. Well, keep your ass at home. Right. So, so if we if we if we if we pull this back around and yeah. um and so we're having what would be for a lot of people very difficult conversations, right? About race right. and about politics and about religion and about values. Yeah. And we don't agree on everything, right? Yeah. We have differences of experiences and opinions, but you and I know each other as, because both of us are coaches. We've yeah. had similar training. Um, we know about emotional intelligence. We know about walking in your wisdom, uh, avoiding your saboteurs, listening beyond the words, um, that there's no such thing as absolutes. We're really clear on filters and perceptions. And so having these tools enables us to have a conversation or I don't take what you're saying personally to me. You don't take what I'm saying personally to you. And that's the hope of, of Firebrands. That's the hope of Firebrands as a conversation and a podcast. That's the hope of Firebrands as eventually when we launch it, our mastermind group. The, the hope of Firebrands is to be able to take fiercely badass women. Sorry, men, it's not for you. You can join and listen in because you will learn something. Um, but this is about creating a sisterhood of women who are super diverse in their experiences, their ages, their upbringing, their ethnicities, their, their faiths and their practices, being open to consider all of it and being willing to challenge what you've been, what you've been taught to believe your entire life in an effort to grow and excel and excel in your personal growth, in relationship growth, in your understanding and tolerance of other people, acceptance of other people, um, in business, in finance, and in all of these areas. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why I ask you to, um, to sit in on the webinar, you know, next week is it's a really great opportunity to take the tool that you and I use on a regular basis yeah. and share it with more people to give them a language to be able to decipher what's what's yeah. truly being said. And I, I just want to throw this out there too. I know um, you are so open and honest on social media and you're very well known. And I guess for me, um, I was having a conversation my husband told me last night that sometimes he thinks my I, my mind just kind of floats with the wind and I told him I was like well I kind of like that about myself because I'm very open to I'm not attached you know I think I'm I'm grounded much more in the fact that I um I do believe in a creator I believe in the universe has got my back I believe that my wisdom shows up in uh, every area of my life to really help guide me and that's pretty much the foundation so beyond that I'm pretty open um when that's why I was telling you <laughs> before we started this like you know, I'm kind of in the middle on a lot of things. <laughs> so. Yeah, and the thing is, like, so I know, especially right now, like, I'm honest enough. To, I'm honest enough to say that my filter, mm -hmm. my filter for racial issues, especially because I am where I am. Yeah. So, like, so because I'm back home where it's 95% white, because I have been racially attacked in the yeah. last few weeks, because I have been called half white trash and a half bred dog, I know that that, that that filter is there and that it is tainting the way that I see things, right? I know that. I, it doesn't mean that the way I'm seeing things isn't true. 
Agreed. It just Agreed. means it just means that it's magnified and it's intensified. Yeah. Um, it's just like um, seeing the color blue, right? Mm -hmm. I can look at the sky and say, "Boy, the sky is blue," right? But if I had a daggone dropper of of royal blue paint, that would be blue, blue, right? And yeah. it's it's not that it's not blue, but I know that um, things are at the surface, right? Um, the way that I equate it is, you know, um, you know how we talk about traumas, the body keeps the score, right? We, when we experience trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma, that stuff sticks in that, in our bodies places, right? So think about it like a bruise that's healed. Well, those damaged blood vessels and, and, and all of that stuff, when they heal and it kind of resides down, you bump it hard enough, you bump it again, that blood's gonna come up easier. You're gonna easily, more easily bruise where you've bruised before, right? Because you've experienced that trauma. It doesn't mean that you're not, it doesn't mean that it's never been healed. It doesn't mean, but healed doesn't mean it doesn't hurt either. The right. thing that I think is so powerful about the work that we do is, is it enables us to recognize our triggers. Yes. Um, it enables us to go, ooh, and, to say, oh, I can honor all the parts of me. I can honor the part of me that is super duper hurt right now and not let, not wallow in it, not suffer in it. Um, and I can be mindful and aware of my steps as, you know, as I'm walking through the process. So I don't stay stuck there. You know, I can get triggered now. And, you know, the trigger that used to kick my ass and, you know, leave me broken for months might leave me broken for 30 minutes today. Um, right. But that's the, that's the reason that, that we do the work. Well, I think that's why conversations are so important. You know, I, I really encourage anyone who has uh, a close friend or, um, you know, someone that oftentimes these conversations are drastically avoided. <laughs> and yeah. the other thing too, um, oftentimes people just assume that other, that the person you're speaking to agrees with you a hundred percent. They just think that I agree. Um, I would encourage you ask some questions, be a little bit more direct and, and be open to their perspective because we are all raised so differently. Uh, even siblings in the same household have different perspectives on their upbringing. So uh, it's just something to get curious about. And, um, and I know that we can have these conversations and walk away. And I, I, I enjoy them. So. I'm the same way. People yeah. think that, you know, it's not about stirring up trouble. It's about right. like, to me, these are the conversations that create more awareness, um, more understanding. It's where you go, huh? I never, I never thought of it like that. Or, Ooh, that's how, that's how that occurred for you. Because right. the way that it occurs for me is completely different, you know? Um, yeah. And that's the beauty of it though, is to be able to say that and then move, move beyond it. Um, it's just like you said, when people assume, so the other day, the day that they called the race for, for Biden, uh, Anaya and I were going through a fast food restaurant and I won't say which one, because I don't want the person who served us to get in trouble, but we were going through a drive through And after the person took our order, there was another person beside him and the other person beside him went to go get the food. And the person at the window leans out the, he leaned out the window and he, he says to me and Anaya, cause we're black. And he says, he's a white guy. He says, y'all see the news? I said, yeah. And he said, what do you think? I said, well, you know, it's the way I voted. I, so I'm all for it. He walked away. He said, agreed. He felt safe saying to us that he agreed and he was glad Biden won because he assumed that because we were of color, right. that that's the way that we voted. And it's just so interesting to see the way, and we laugh when we laugh, <laughs> we laugh. And it, even in my mind though, it's like, so I don't know. Cause even that it's like, well, isn't that still a racial bias? It is. It you is. Know? It's not a, a necessarily negative one, but what if you guys were Trumpers? Absolutely. So you know? this, yeah, but so, so like I literally had a white woman here in this community who mm -hmm. was an ally when it comes to ballot health right. say to me on social media that um, 
that I needed to, to, that because, listen to this, because I was on the Democrat plantation, then oh. that meant I had to be okay with everything that Master Joe said. And I literally was like, did you just fix your mouth to say plantation and master in the same that, sentence? That, that is a, that was a term coin. I forget, but there, that is a common term, the democratic plantation. That is. That's what she said. Point. And I was like, well, nobody, nobody white's been brave enough to say that shit to me. Right. And <laughs> <laughs> literally that was my reaction was, did you just fucking say like, dem because, but why is that? Because I bet you they don't say it about white people on the Democratic plantation. Right, they say it about no. black folk. I, I think that's um I think that is a Candace Owens. I might be wrong, but I think that was a Candace Owens thing from her book. Yeah, you know wrong. she makes me vomit in my mouth. So yeah, but and she, here, don't get me wrong, she's she's intelligent. Like yeah. she's intelligent and all of that, but I don't like her because she's a charlatan. I don't like her because she says to people now, I never experienced racism. And yet when she was 18 years old, the NAACP sued her school on her behalf because three or four white boys were racially harassing her. And one of them happened to be the son of like the mayor or the superintendent or whatever. And they won her almost $40,000 in a lawsuit. So how do you stand in front of the world and say, I've never experienced racism. And yet the NAACP won a case on your behalf, little black girl. Oh yeah, I don't know, I don't know. See? See? But I mean, that, I, you know, it's just double standards, but they- It's all about that check. <laughs> Yeah, they they definitely occur. For it sure. always comes back to the money, right? It does. Uh, yeah, I know. We got to wrap. We got to for wrap. some people. Yeah, we're gonna wrap. So yeah. the 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 goal is to have these conversations um, twice a month, right? Every other Friday, um, throw them up on the podcast, put it out on social media. Um, if you would like to uh, have us address an issue, if you'd like to have us discuss a topic then you can email me at danny at the rantings of and, uh, and we will tackle that issue. We may get to the point where we let people call in while we're alive and that sort of thing. And we'll just take this thing and see how it goes. So uh, I appreciate you hanging out with me today, Chick. We will do it again in two weeks and I'll talk to you before then. It was fun. Thanks for having me. All right. Peace, you guys. We're Bye. out.